Welcome, Pudding People, to another episode of Everybody Loves Pudding. I am your host, Ken Seymour, here with your other host, Richard Geiger. Hello. Today we have a fantastic episode for you. We have a guest with us that is a writer of comic books, a man of comic books, a man about town, most recently about Chicago, but you know, uh, other places too. Mr. John Parrish, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. So we were able to run into you at NWI Comic Con a, a few weeks back and were impressed with uh, the work that we were able to see with what you had. And we were hoping uh, for our listeners you could give us just a little bit of description of who you are and what you do, and we'll go from there. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yes, uh, my name is John Harris. I am a comic book writer from Northwest Indiana and the East Pacific. Uh, I've been, I've always wanted to make comics. I've been thinking about it and trying to figure out how to do it since like, high school. Uh, made, finally made my first comic around the time I graduated from college uh, and have been making comics, writing comics, uh, almost roughly eight or nine years. Uh, got a little more serious about, you know, marketing myself going to conventions in 2015. Uh, and just been, you know, working on it, plugging away ever since. Excellent. So yeah. you, you've been a fan of comic books for a while then. Ah, yes, yes. Um, when I was really young, uh, like my dad was really into comics, and, you know, he showed me different kinds of comics. So, uh, like, I read a lot of Spider-Man that was, you know, could find that like anywhere so like i would pick that up at like the grocery store the pharmacy i could get copies of you know amazing spider-man spectacular spider-man web of spider-man like all those titles um but he also showed me like you know collected editions of like calvin and Hobbes. and so i just always loved just the art and the you know the combination of art and words uh just to a really good degree and i it was something i always wanted to do uh at some point so, what is the name of your uh, of your favorite comic uh, character? I mean, is it, is it Spider Man? Is that kind of what that that you fixated on? Because I know when I was a kid, you know, when I was young, young, it was the Hulk because Hulk could smash. Were mm-hmm. Were you definitely a Spider Man kind of guy then? Um, I, yeah, I'd say so. I think I think it was like in terms of just like comics. Like, in general, it was probably Spider-Man, but I think in terms of just, like, superheroes and, like, you know, like, the old cartoons and things of that nature, it's probably, like, Wolverine. I think Wolverine was probably my favorite, but I, it was harder to find. For some reason, like, I didn't get to go to comic book shops as often, so, like, there was more Spider-Man that I could find than, like, X-Men comics, if that made sense. So I just, there was always Spider-Man comics, so that was usually what I was able to pick up and get my hands on. But in terms of just overall, like, media, uh, growing up, I was a really big fan of, like, Wolverine and, like, you know, the X-Men, um, specific, yeah, specifically Wolverine. No, I've uh, I've always loved Calvin and Hobbes too. I think I think that one's fun. You mentioned that that one earlier. I think that one's pretty attainable too. But uh, did you yeah. n- did you notice that? I, I guess I was in the same boat too. I always felt that X Men, the X Men universe, was a little bit more mm-hmm. attainable as far as being able to find content for it, including things on uh, the. Like the cartoons that are on TV, is that some? Is that another reason that you gravitated towards them? Uh, yeah, I, I just like I said, like because I didn't have access to like a local comic book shop. Like a lot of my love of like like growing up, like watching superheroes and watching like things that came from comics, uh, usually was through other mediums. So it's like yeah, like the uh like there was like the iron man cartoons that i mean they weren't fantastic but they you know i could find them on tv um x-men you could find x-men cartoons there were x-men arcade games there was you know there was so much out there beyond just the comic books whereas like if i went to like the pharmacy or i went somewhere to like look through the magazine rack and try to find like a comic book i could pick up it was it felt like i could find like spider-man more easily um, so usually that was what I picked up, 
Um, and you, I, and when I say what I picked up is like what my mother approved of, because like I think Image was out, but a lot of stuff was a little more uh, brutal for probably that she then she would want me to be looking at. Speaking of things that children should not necessarily be uh, listening to, I will give the briefest of warnings, and we'll probably put something in the description. We're now going to speak a little bit about some of the work that you've done. And, you know, sometimes language okay. is an issue for some people, <laughs> not for me. I, yeah. I don't really care. But the uh, the, the titles that, uh, that come to mind when looking at your work, uh, Secrets and Shadows and Clusterfuck? Yes. Tell... <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that, or those, I guess. Um, okay, um, Secrets and Shadows was actually the first comic I actually uh, made. Uh, I had always like written comic book scripts, and I had a bunch of stuff. Like, like I said, I've been doing it since like I was in high school. But I finally, like around the time I was getting ready to leave, uh, graduate from college, I finally just came to the idea or conclusion that I was going to make a comic. And so I came up with this comic. Uh, which what became Secrets and Shadows, where it was like a superhero story, and it was uh, takes place in a city that hasn't had a supervillain in about five years. And basically, because of that, the heroes kind of get kind of complacent and kind of lazy. Um, and in the course of the story, like a real villain shows up, and they're not prepared. And so basically, he just starts taking them out one by one. And it's about the heroes having to figure out how to stop them, who he is, and there's like you know different elements of drama and relationships between certain characters that kind of gets uh, explored within that. And it focuses on a character who is father is essentially like the city's greatest hero. And he kind of has a, like disdain for that life. So he kind of lives off and does his own thing. It's like a dishwasher somewhere. And as the story <laughs> goes on, he kind of has to decide if he's going to like step up or if he's going to, you know, kind of keep this simple life that he's liked and that he's, you know, wanted to have for so long. Um, and that's Secrets and Shadows. And uh, Clusterfuck is a comic. It actually started uh, from a story I used to write in high school uh, to, like, entertain my friends because we didn't really pay attention in U.S. history class. So I would write these stories just to make, like, two of the guys and, like, that sat behind me laugh. And so it started out as just, like, an exaggeration of who we were and, like, these wacky adventures. And I'd, like, write about the day we had, and then I'd bring it back and let them read it. Um, and I think what, uh, after I finished Secrets by Shadows, I just wanted to do something a little bit more fun, a little bit more um, not as serious. You know, I was, like, with Secrets and Shadows, it was, such a, it was a much more serious book. So I wanted to do something fun, and so I, I just immediately looked at that and remembered having so much fun writing with characters and uh, creating that world and being able to let loose a little bit. So I uh, made that book, and at the time I didn't have a title um, for the story. And so I remember I was talking to my editor, and he was like, well, you need to make a title. And I remember in my mind, like, all this stuff was happening around me as I was writing it, and I just remember thinking, like, everything was such a clusterfuck. And it fit the story so well that I was like, oh, that, that's the title. And it worked. So. Now, I, I kind of had noticed that when you said you, when you got done with school and got done with uh, college, you, you moved to uh, Japan. Is that right? Yeah, uh, about a year. I think I, I, after I graduated, I worked in my hometown for like a year. And then like roughly a year after like, so, like, yeah, 2010, I, June 2010, I got uh, left and went to work in Japan for about two years. And and that what was that was the time frame. You you were uh, teaching English uh, over there, right? Mm -hmm. And was that is that the time frame that you were writing a large portion of your uh, Secrets and Shadows? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that was actually, yeah, one of the big things was that uh, getting that job in Japan actually gave me the money that I could finance the book uh, and pay the artists and pay the people because I think we had, like, the year, the job I got immediately out of college, I could fund the book, but it just took so much longer because I didn't make that much. And um, 
So it just took longer to write or longer to pay the artists and get the money together. But when the job in Japan came through, um, it paid really well and my cost of living was really low. Like my apartment, I think my rent was like, like roughly like maybe $90 a month. <laughs> wow. And so like I had a lot of money that I could kind of save up and then to pay the artists and get the books made. And we were able to just like get it done a lot faster. I think, I, the book got done maybe like a year faster than I thought it would, like than I thought it would, just because of how much money I was able to uh, accumulate and save up, and you know how quickly I was able to pay the artist on the books. So it, yeah, I, but I primarily worked on that when I was in Japan, and then I think I wrote a little bit of maybe the first three issues of Clusterfuck while I was there too, like maybe in my second year. Before I left, I wrote a. I at least wrote the first three issues. Did Did any of that time living there have an influence on what you were writing for 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 both of those works? Um, I think Secrets and Shadows, and not so much. I think I I might have finished writing or had been at the end of writing the scripts for the book. Um maybe when I first got to Japan, like, or I, maybe I've been in Japan for at least a couple months. Um, but Clusterfuck, most definitely, like, one of the reasons I wrote it was just, like, there was just so much going on, like, um, around that time, like, 2011, like, there was a tsunami that hit Japan. And so I was living on the coast, and so I was living in an area that was affected by that. Um, so dealing with that and dealing with... Um, just different things about the job had, you know, become frustrating. Um, I think like a little bit, like a, like a little bit a year after the tsunami, like my father died. So it was just like all this stuff happening in that second year of being in Japan that made it kind of rough. So it was like I needed to do something a little bit more upbeat. Um, and I think subconsciously some of that stuff came out in the book where it's kind of about not necessarily knowing what's going on. Sometimes there's stuff going on and you don't really understand what's going on and it's just like all this chaos, but you kind of have to just make the best of it and deal with it. Because um, in Clusterfuck, like Jim and Carl, the main characters, they don't really know what's going on. Like they don't really know the full scope of what happens or why the conflict that's going on in the story is happening. They just know people are trying to like attack them and stuff, but they, I don't think they ever really fully understand, but they're just dealing with it the best they can. Um, so I think that kind of came from that. Like, in hindsight, like, when I looked back, I was like, oh, maybe that's why I wrote it like that. Hmm. Now, while you were in Japan, did you have the opportunity to visit Akihabara? Um, no. No, I, I didn't. I, I, I'll be honest, I was really... Uh, it was very boring when I was in Japan. <laughs> I uh, went and I think I only went like a couple places. I usually pretty much stayed in like the area where my like job was. Um, I think I went to Tokyo and I went a couple, like I went to like Tokyo with some friends like around my birthday. And then I went to Sapporo for like the big festival where they have like those massive snow sculptures. Mm. Fun. And I think I think that was really it. Like, I was really boring. Like, people were always, what I was asked, like, oh, are you going to go here? Are you going to go to Kyoto? Are you going to go to all these places? And I was like, no. And I'd ask why, and I'd be like, well, I always said I, I wanted to see Japan. And so I was living there. So I kind of was like, well, every day I open my door, I see Japan. So I was, like, more focused on doing my job. Kind of makes sense to me. Eventually, I, I think I will personally have to make a trip. Uh, one of the largest conglomeration of manga and anime all in one spot. I, I can imagine yeah. that that would be a uh, kind of a, a playground for anybody that was interested in that kind of a that kind of a geeky thing, like I I occasionally can be. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I, I think I was, and I think like when we went on the like on the trip like we because when we went to tokyo um we might have gone through but we didn't stay like i think we like we might have like looked around but like we didn't like really get into it but it was like 
a bunch of stuff that happened like during the trip. So it was like some people are getting sick and there was like a lot of stuff like, so it was kind of, we were kind of on a schedule because it was like, uh, I think two of my friends from there, they were, we all went to Tokyo and from there they were going on a vacation and then me and someone else who had never really been outside of, who had never really been traveling, we're, ha- we're going to have to find our way back from Tokyo and we hadn't really traveled there like like the people who were leaving were the people who were our guides so we were kind of trying to figure stuff out and figure out how to how we're going to get home after they left um but you know i think if i get the chance to go back i would probably be more i mean i would be more inclined because i wouldn't have a job that i was like incredibly focused on there Mm. i would you know allow myself to be a tourist and do more touristy things if that makes sense that makes absolute sense to me. Mm-hmm. So, okay, we were talking about meeting you at NWI, and we were talking a little bit off of the air, as it were, uh, before we started mm-hmm. about uh, conventions and the like. And it's a staple of anybody that's trying to uh, get their brand out there and do something with their work. Mm-hmm. Um, you just got back from C2E2, uh, in Chicago, how did that go? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's a really good show. It's probably uh, like for the longest time, it was like the top of conventions I actually wanted to, you know, sell my books at. Um, I think I'd gone to maybe two conventions just as a fan um, pre prior to the first E2E2. I think I went to the first E2E2, uh, to a, my first E2E2 back in 2013. Um, maybe like, yeah, I don't have been back from Japan for maybe a year or so. And, um, I think I did like another convention and I didn't have a real time, like just, it was just really congested. It was really crowded. Um, it was hard to find what I was looking for. And so it kind of made me be like, oh, this isn't good. And then I went to see you too. And just, it was just, it was like, like night and day. Like I had a great time there. I enjoyed um, just seeing so many people, uh, just the layout. I could find the artists and the creators that I wanted to see. And it just, I don't know, it just, the vibe was so much better that after I went that first time, I was like, okay, I'm going to come back and one day I'm going to uh, sell my books here. And that was the goal. Cause I think at that point I hadn't even been to a convention as a comic book creator. I had just gone as a fan. And so that immediately became something I wanted to do. Um, so, yeah, I love C2E2. It's, it's, it's like, it can be a bit hectic because it's so many people. And it's probably the largest show I've ever, like, worked. Um, but I, I always, like, the last two years I've done it, um, I've always come out feeling really energized, really, you know, excited about comic books and excited about what I'm doing. And, and it's great to see people that, you know, maybe I sold to them at NWICon or I sold to them, you know, they bought one of my books at a show somewhere else that will come and say, like, oh, I bought your book, you know, years ago and it was really good and I really enjoyed it. You know, what do you have? And just that, I don't know, it was just like a really good feeling. Because sometimes I think when people make comics, it takes a while to see the, to get the validation or to get the recognition because you work on the book for so long and then it comes out. Um, and then even when it comes out, you might not get that recognition immediately. So sometimes it's like good to have it where, you know, having people come up and say, Oh, you're John Parrish. And they know who I am. That like blows my mind every time. Um, but yeah, C2E2 definitely left me feeling like really energized and excited about you know what I was doing and picking comics. Uh, and I, I always loved it. Like, even if I don't, if I didn't go again, like, for some reason I couldn't sell my books there, I'd definitely go again just as a fan, just to go and just enjoy the ad- atmosphere because it's just always such a fun time. Do you think that living in this area, you know, particularly in uh, northwest Indiana, in Chicago, has kind of made that uh, process of creating, uh, made the process of marketing a lot easier. I, I just feel like we're in a pretty good corridor here where it goes from Chicago to Indy. Um, you got Milwaukee and mm-hmm. just like there's just a lot that tends to go on in this little patch, this little area right through here. 
almost definitely. Like, there's a lot of, like, really good shows. Because I, I haven't done Indiana Comic Con the last two years because they were, like, for so long, they were just really close to P2E2. So I think before I went to P2E2, I did Indiana Comic Con maybe the year before I did C2E2, so maybe, like, three years ago. But, um, there, and, you know, there are multiple smaller conventions that, like, NWI Con, that, you know, you get to meet not only uh, local creators that maybe you might not have seen if you just did, you know, bigger shows, like, you also get to see, you know, lots of local fans and, and kind of cultivate, you know, people that you will see that, you know, maybe go check out your stuff because you're from the same area or you're from the same, uh, you know, like if I, if I go down to Indianapolis or somewhere, it's like you're from the same state, but there's that, oh, this person is local, they're from here. Um, but it's like there's just a large amount of, you know, conventions, big and small, within this area. And like, yeah, living, like I live just, living just outside of Chicago, like there's tons of conventions, there's tons of shows, there's tons of comic book shops. Like it's a really good area to be in that I feel like sometimes maybe I don't fully utilize as much as I should, but it's something I'm getting better with. Um, you know, I'm trying to get better at and do better at. So you know, takes time. Does it always uh, does it also serve potentially as a tool to meet some of the artists that you may want to collaborate with on some of your work, or do you tend to use other avenues for that? Um, like I've, I've met a lot of artists. Uh, like I, I, when I started, what I did was I met when I would look for artists. Usually, I just asked people that I knew because, like I said, I was making comics or trying to figure out how to make comics in high school. And so I was on, like, message boards. So what I used to do was I would find people through the connections I made on those message boards. Um, and, like, that's how I actually met, like, the artists for Secrets and Shadows. Both of, the, both of the artists that worked on that were through recommendations from, like, my editor, who I also met on that, uh, on a message board. I think it was, it was digitalwebbing.com. That's what I used to frequent. Um, and so I, I'm getting more into trying to find people that I can meet and collaborate with. But at first, when I didn't really know anyone, I didn't really go to any shows. I tried to reach out to, like, connections I'd already made and people I interacted with, you know, through the Internet. Um, but I think, you know, as time goes on, uh, and I meet a lot of really incredible artists, like, even if I don't have anything for them now, I do, like, take their card. And I do, like kind of have like a little Rolodex or a little uh, of sorts next to my computer that I can look at artists and be like, oh, this person, I really like their stuff. And if I come up with a new idea or I have a new story that I might, that I feel fits their style, then I can create, you know, I can um, reach out to them. And I think it, it might, and it'll make a difference because I, a lot of the artists I've worked with do live overseas and a lot of the artists that were recommended to me were in other countries. So it's people I haven't, you know, sat down across from a table with or have seen eye to eye, you know, met in person. So I think that'll be an interesting thing to, to do in the future. That's understandable. I rarely see eye to eye with anybody. So it, it works out, <laughs> though, eventually. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I say eye to eye, I mean, you know, I, mean, <laughs> I got to have a little fun with you. <laughs> So, yeah, no, that's fine. who is uh, who is somebody you really kind of geeked about their style right now? I know my my tastes change over time, but there there are some people I go back to, and occasionally I'll just find somebody, and you know, at, for a while I'm just uh, infatuated with the way that they they do their work. Do you have anybody like that? Oh, uh, you mean like an artist? Yeah. Oh, um, let me see. You mean like a big artist, uh, like a, hey, anybody? Everything like, is fair game here. I put you on the spot to come up with a name, so you, it can be anybody. Um, I know, like an artist, like I haven't really been like super paying attention to a lot of like books, but the art, like an artist, I always uh, used to think was really cool and like really like their style was uh, uh, Humberto Ramos. 
Hmm. Um, he's done a lot of cool stuff. I really, I just like his style. Of, like I always had a, like growing up, I always had a, like like that animated style. That kind of had like a manga type of feel for it. Because um, I remember when I was a kid, I picked up, like I looked through like a vampire book he did. Um, it's called like Crimson or something. But I just always thought it was a really cool style, a really cool look. Um, and then I think uh, artists who, like, I haven't I haven't read the book in a while, but I really thought it had a really cool style was um, uh, Mateo, was it Mateo Clara. He did like he, he was on Black Science. Mm. I think. Yeah, I think the, like like those are artists whose like stuff I always like I was really interesting, and like in terms of artists like like independent artists and like indie guys like I mean I would love the people that I've worked with like I think uh, I was like the artist one of the artists on Secrets and Shadows Dexter Wee I think his art is like really good and like the stuff that he does is just really phenomenal um as well as like I said the guy that does cluster fuck is uh Diego Toro and he does a lot of great stuff and just being able to work with both of them over the years and see their style uh grow and evolve and and, and just all the stuff that they can do is just really cool to me. Uh, I just like the, the the dynamic stuff that both of them can do, and they both have a very different style. But I, you know, the stuff that they can, like the stuff I write that they can make happen, is just really cool. Just to see like words that I wrote uh, become these full images and be better than anything I could ever like imagine in my head. All right, so I've got I got some hard hitting questions here. Right? <laughs> um, uh, you you uh, obviously you're in uh, kind of a a pizza zone, right? In, in Northwest Indiana, Chicago area. <laughs> um, are you are you a, are you a pizza eater? Yeah. Okay, so yep. do you have like what is your favorite? Like, do you have a favorite place to go to, or do you have like a favorite style of pizza? Um, the favorite place to go to, uh, let's see, there were, there are a couple, like, in, like, in Hammond, there are a couple different pizza places. Um, one that, like, uh, you know, I try to order, like, if I, if I can, if I, if I can afford it, and I really feel like, you know, I want to, you know, like, I really just want a pizza, and I want to get, like, what I really love is there's a place called Barton's, uh, Barton, I think it's Barton's Pizzeria, there's one in, in Hammond. Um, I really enjoy it, and I'll be honest, like I said, I'm very boring, so it's like just pepperoni and sausage like <laughs> together, um, maybe Italian sausage, uh, you know, every now and then, you know, we'll throw stuff on there, like mushrooms and peppers, but like I said, I'm very, I'm kind of, I'm very, like, not a picky eater, but I'm just very, I don't try to make, I keep things simple, um, but I like that, that uh, there's a place, it's called I think it's Eduardo's, and then they do deep dish pizza, and so they had one, and uh, it had like mushrooms and uh, green peppers, and like I don't remember what it's called. Off, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it was um, really good. So I, 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 don't, I like deep dish pizza. I like, um, like, you know, like flat. I don't know. Like like a, like a pan. Whatever. I like. Yeah. Are you, what about are you are you a thin crust person? Um, it's important questions here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. I have. I, I I'll be honest. When it comes to pizza, I'm not really uh, like in. When it comes to like pizza and pizza crust, like I'm not really picky. Like I'll eat deep dish. I'll eat thin crust. I'll you know like whatever there is. I'm not really picky about the style of pizza, and usually I'm not super pick, like picky about the toppings of pizza like if someone had like a specific kind of pizza they wanted and it had like stuff a bunch of stuff on it like onions and uh peppers and mushrooms and like all this stuff on it like i wouldn't like turn my nose up at it it's just usually if i make a decision or i pick what kind of pizza i want it's just i just pick simple stuff pineapple on pizza yes or no <laughs> I think it depends on the amount of pineapple. I think there's, um, there can be too much pineapple, but I I have no I have no problem with pineapple on pizza, as long as it's like 
it doesn't get to be like overkill. Gotcha. So yeah, real real hard hitting. This is what I was saying. <laughs> I've got a few more, but I'll go back to Ken with actual real questions. Well, you know, yeah, we, we got to divide it up good. So every writer has a group of individuals that have influenced them over the years, whether they mm-hmm. be other comic book writers or uh, more traditional uh, writers. Who are some of the individuals that you look to for inspiration that really that really influenced you? Um, I guess as a writer, I think, like I said, like I read a lot of like Calvin and Hobbes though, as a kid, like that, that style, like of what like, um, Bill Watterson did. I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. I, I like, I always like, even now I can go back and read some Calvin and Hobbes and that'll make me smile. Um, in terms of like, and then in like superhero comics, I think when I was like, I kind of stopped reading a lot of, like, main, like DC, Marvel comics. I stopped reading a lot of Western comics around high school. That's, like, when anime, like, manga started showing up, and it was, like, in all the Barnes and Nobles and Borders and stuff like that. Um, but when I was uh, in college, I had a friend, and he was, like, he showed me, like, a bunch of other stuff. And so he showed me some books. Uh, you know, he showed me Sandman, um and a bunch of, you know, other books that kind of brought me back into comics, but one of the books I kind of picked out myself um, was uh, Powers. And so I, I liked, you know, Brian Michael Bendis' stuff, and I really liked uh, what it was. Uh, there were three books I picked out. It was, um, like, I think I picked out I, I picked up Powers, and then, like, one of my, my roommate read it, so then I didn't have to buy it anymore, so I would just read his. Hmm. And then uh, three Vertigo books I picked up. It was like A Hundred Bullets, Fables, and Why the Last Man. And so, like, uh, yeah, so those were three books I really enjoyed. And three books, like, when I looked at it, it just blew my mind because I hadn't seen a lot of books, out, you know, comic books outside of Marvel and DC and, like, maybe a little bit of image. But it was just, like, so different. And it wasn't about, you know, superheroes. It wasn't about saving the day. And like I said, you know, I had limited options as a kid. So if I read a comic book, usually that's what it was. Um, so I was able to see that there was more to Western comics than like, like I said, so Brian Azzarello as a writer, I thought, you know, when I was reading it, it was really interesting in this deal. Like, uh, like what uh, the first volume takes place in Chicago. And so he had, you know, characters and they would talk about stuff that was here and use like local slang and things like that. It seemed like very interesting and very cool. Um, and I liked just the way that, you know, I liked the way that the characters and the story played out in a hundred bullets, like the conspiracies and the twists and the backstabbing and things like that. Like things I couldn't, it just seemed really complex to me that I, at the time I didn't think I would be able to do. Um, and I liked, uh, you know, I liked Fable because it was the book, completely different so they're really interesting concepts so I think um, I was, that's, that was Bill Willingham I think yeah I liked his stuff but I I, I just thought those were like really interesting uh, characters I think that was the thing that always drew me with a lot of those books were just really interesting characters and, and really unique concepts that like I would have never thought up or maybe I wouldn't have been able to weave the stories the way they did um but I think when I was, yeah, sorry, but I think when I was getting back into comics, it was always, like, I had this thing where uh, I would say, like, uh, Brian Azzarello, Brian Michael Bendis, and Brian K. Vaughn was Why the Last Man, and I was like, it was like three bald guys named Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really liked their stuff, and then, like I said, I liked Fable, and I liked the Willingham stuff, but, like, it didn't fit because his name wasn't Brian, and I don't think he was bald. Um, <laughs> Well, Fable is but, definitely a favorite of my wife's. Yeah, that, yeah, it was a really enjoyable, uh, you know, book. Uh, so there were those, and I think a lot of the stuff that really inspired me was also, like, uh, animation. Like, I really liked uh, animation growing up, so I'd say, like, um, like I liked uh, Cowboy Bebop. I don't know why, but that really made me want to be a better writer. Like, when I read that in high school, I think that was what made me want to write like, that made me want to be a, a writer. And then 
um, when I finally saw that I could write something like visually, because I don't know why, but as a kid, I didn't think I could write comics. I thought I, I could write prose, but I didn't really know how to get into writing comic books. Um, and for some reason, I was working on a story, and I was like, oh, this would look better if I could make it that people could see what I was, you know, describing, or I could just show them. And then I stumbled across a, I stumbled across an article or, or a link to the message board on, like, Wizard, the Wizard magazine. I think that's how I found my way onto that message board. And once, like, I saw, like, somebody else's script and how they formatted and wrote a script, I was like, oh, I could do that. And that kind of helped me get into it. But um, just the stuff that the writers on, like, Cowboy Bebop did, I thought was really good. And just the way that that looked and the way that it, the world that was built within that also made me want to be a writer. Like, but that sort of story. Um a lot of sorry, yeah, I'm going on like wild tangents, but I hey, had a lot of we love it. I'm good. Different influences. Now, uh, for now, for our listeners who are not completely familiar, Wizard was a magazine during the explosion of the comic book industry that dealt entirely with stories about comic book artists and comic book writers and the issues and things that were coming up and associated things, and they would run. Uh, they would run contests. I remember participating in one that you could win every single Magic the Gathering card if you just happened to send enough stuff to them. It was it was a scavenger contest. And at that point, I was, uh, I was hugely into Magic. And so I decided that I'm going to win this contest. I looked at the list like, I've got half this stuff in my house. So it shouldn't be too hard to do it. I got everything but like three or four items and... The three or four items that I couldn't get, I sent an explanation how you can't actually get them. They wanted a Mexican jumping bean. It's out of season. Mm-hmm. You can't get them. They're, yeah. they're just not there. You know, things like that. And I didn't win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was disheartening. Yeah, Wizard was like a, weir- like a a very accessible magazine in the sense that I remember we'd go to the grocery store uh, and... My mom and dad will walk around the grocery store and buy groceries for an hour, but I'd just go over to the rack where the magazines were, and there would be Wizard. And I could sit and read through all the stuff that was in there. And they would do their thing, and I would sit and waste time over there. It's great. I like that kind of Oh, yeah, most definitely. And I think that also helped, like, with the accessibility, with just, like, you could find a Wizard magazine. Like, I could find it at, like, a Walgreens, or I could find it, you know, I could find it anywhere, roughly. Um and I think for a little while, like when we could, when like we could afford it, I think like I subscribed for a little bit. I think I might have had it, like got one of the like I think it was like a year subscription. Um, I think it was like I couldn't remember how much it was, but it wasn't too much that I could convince my mom like to let me have the subscription. Because um, I had a ton. I remember I had a ton of them. I had a box full of them. Um, I found them like this was years ago, but. I, yeah, I, it was a really, it was a really good uh, magazine just to get kids into comics and see like the people who make the books and you know delve a little bit deeper into you know what happens behind the scenes because I didn't know what any of the artists or writers looked like. I didn't know their names or you know like some of the people I might not have known their names as a kid. I didn't look at the credits at first. I didn't. That's not what I was there for. Yeah. Um, but. You know, then it's like I could see people's names, like, because they had, like, the top ten, they had, like, top ten lists. So it was, like, the top ten writers and artists. And, I, I mean, I remember it was, like, I think Jim Lee was at the top a lot. So it's like I knew who he was. Mm-hmm. And then if I saw his art, I'd be like, oh, he was the guy that was doing X-Men. Of course he's, like, at the top. <laughs> so, yeah, it, I really enjoyed that at magazine. It was really helpful. Yeah, they don't really have anything quite like that now. I mean, you can get a lot of the information that you need from the internet from a variety of places, including, mm-hmm. including like uh, Comic Vine. It's very popular. By the way, you may want to contact them. They have misspelled your name, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, you get more like a YouTube nowadays. Like you know, I, I like listening to the Comics Explained uh, mm-hmm. with uh, Rob. I'm, I'm forgetting his last name at the moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the current link to a very similar feel. In fact, I've been trying to contact Rob to get him to come onto the show, 
But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> been unsuccessful thus far. Well, I think I, I think the uh, like the video aspect of it. So you know, lately, as e- even one of the subjects of our podcast that we do is uh, comics in the movies, which can I mean, there's just tons of different types of movies that are actually based on comic books. Is there something out there mm. that um, you've read, you've seen? Uh, now we can't be biased. So besides your comic books, right? Cause we want, you know, we want yours to be in TV shows and movies. Is there something out there that you have read that you're like, man, this would be so good as a movie or a TV show. And it's not there yet. Um, just deep. Um, cause I was going to say like, there's a, like a, well, a book that I really liked that I did, uh, that, Actually, it was really helpful, but a book I really liked, but it got me into a movie with I Kill Giants. Like I thought, mm. I thought that would make a really, a really good like animated film. I thought it was like just because of the style that of the book, the art style of uh, what's the artist? I can't remember. Uh, J. I think it's J. K. Nomura. Uh, like the art style just made it look like, oh, if this was a cartoon film, it would be amazing. And it was a live action film, and I thought it was really good. Um, I don't know. Like I always like. Back in the day, I was trying. I always wanted like a, a hundred bullet series. I thought that would be a really good type of show to have. Um, yeah, it definitely have to be that, TV. Yeah, you know, like that Game of Thrones. Uh, you know, massive cast. Anybody can die. Betrayals type thing. I mean, it doesn't have like monsters and dragons and zombies uh, or White Walkers, but. You know, but it had that, you know, massive ensemble cast and you could have like multiple seasons type thing. But um, I don't know, like, yeah, outside of that, I I haven't I haven't seen anything that I think, man, this should be a show. And it's like not in production or something right now. Like Mm -hmm. there are a lot of shows I've I've looked at or like I've seen like they're like, oh, this is going to be a show now. And I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. So. (laughs) Yeah, big big jump lately. That's that's like that. It's pretty crazy. We when, well, we've been talking mm-hmm. about it a little bit. We're still in the 1990s on our history of comic book movies. Uh, once we get uh, once we get into the 2000s, it starts to really just spike the number of uh, <laughs> the number of entries that you get. Um, okay, well maybe oh, yeah. maybe the question should be not what do you wish has uh, to be made into it of the things that have come out in the last few years what are some of your favorites that have come out in uh, movies are you more on the side of uh, marvel doing a good job with the movies uh do you like the dc stuff what's uh, what do you think what's what's been some of your favorites i mean like i think when it comes to like my favorite most recently, I think it would have to be Into the Spider-Verse. Like, I just really liked that movie. Uh, it was really well animated, really well done. I liked the story. Um, I'd, I'd always wanted to see more animated comic book films just because I felt like the crossover would be a lot better. Yeah. It would be a lot not easier in terms of, like, budget and man hours and things but just it just makes so much sense it translates like, and it always yeah it, it always just like blew my mind because like growing up at, you know DC had all the great cartoons like I mean I liked the X-Men cartoon a lot and I liked Spider-Man but like Batman the animated series was just like on another level and then like even Superman and Justice League and uh, Teen Titans and like all those shows like DC had all the cartoons and while they had animated, like, series, I never, like, they had animated films, a lot of them just went straight to video, or they were straight to, like, uh, like video on demand, or they were on streaming services, but, like, I think the only one outside of recently that DC did was, like, Mask of the Phantasm, mm-hmm. and I was always like, man, there should be more stuff, like, they should do more big screen stuff, and maybe it just for the people, like the executives or whatever, maybe it just didn't make sense. But to me, I was always like, why don't we get more stuff like that? Like, Oh, yeah. Um, so, I always, so I was, like, really excited to see, you know, uh, Into the Spider-Verse. And 
you know, I've paid, I just, I just really enjoyed it. Um, you know, cause I, I'm trying to think of what I've seen. Cause I, like I said, I like, I like, like I enjoy the Marvel movie. Um, but it's just a lot. <laughs> so I, I, I try not to like go to all of them. Like when I was younger, uh, like my dad was really into like, we would go to every comic book movie, like every single one. So we went to, all of them. So we went to see Daredevil. We went to see Punisher. We went to see, I think yeah, we went to see Ghost Rider. Um, and we went and saw like most of the MCU movies like Iron Man and uh, all the way up to, I think we went and saw First Avenger. And then I think that might have been the last movie I saw before I went to Japan. I think. And then because Avengers came out in 2012. Like, yeah came out like May 2012 and I remember that because you know me and my dad had seen all the movies and then when I left he was seeing all the movies leading up to the Avengers um but unfortunately he passed away like in March so he didn't get to see the Avengers um but I like but like I said but after that it was just so many movies I really you know and I liked I liked uh the Guardians movies I liked the Guardians of the Galaxy I liked the first one those are super I the fun one too. I like Mm-hmm. They were super fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I like those. I think around like maybe Age of Ultron, I started pulling back on seeing like all of them because I was like, okay, this is, this is like these these things are making like billions of like a billion dollars. I don't need to go to every single one. <laughs> um, and so I kind of like I'll go and see ones like I, I'm more pull into the ones that are like one offs. You know, like. Uh, you know, like see and like maybe see Ant Man or maybe see like uh, Captain Marvel or maybe see something like that. But I don't go to every single one now because it's like it, it got to a point where it's just like, man, I, I don't have the, the the patience to sit in the theater like every few months, kind of thing. Um, and then I, I don't know. I went and saw a couple of DC films, but I, I was just never a not like I'm not a fan of Zack Snyder, but it was just never my thing, like the, the visuals of it. And so it's like, if that's not my thing, and he was doing all the big one, all the big movies, it was like, well, why, why would I go if, yeah. that, if I know that that's not what I'm into? Um, but I, you know, I went to a Suicide Squad, and I mean, I enjoyed it. I think I didn't hate it as much as I feel like some people do. Like, I could see, like, really good parts in it, but then I could also see parts that I really wish were better. And there were, but I, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd like to see more stuff from DC that, you know, is... Better? A different <laughs> visually, yeah. Like, like but different visually, because it's, like, it's hard. Like, because I said, it's, like, if you're not into, like, Zack Snyder's style... That was like three of the movies of however many movies that have come out so far. So it's like you're not gonna you're not gonna go in like it. Yeah, you're, you're, why would you go? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like if, if if you didn't like that style, like why would you go? You know, see the rest of them. Um, but like yeah, like I liked Suicide Squad because it looked, it looked different than the other movies. Um, like I enjoyed Wonder Woman. Uh, and, you know, I, I might go see Shazam. I don't know if I'm going to go see Shazam, but it looks good. I like, uh, was it Zach, Zach Levy, Zach Levi? Zachary Levi, I, I yeah. I like his stuff. Yeah, Zachary Levi. I like him. I, you know, I used to watch Chuck. Um, so I, I and, uh, but I, I, I don't have, like, I'm not one of those people where it's, like, one or the other. No. I just love to see, like, good films. Um, and I, but I also am trying to limit my... Like going to like if it's like going to tons of films, because it just yeah it can I think in some ways it can like wear you down. You can get exhausted just from going, just having to go and to be like with Marvel, having to keep up with like every movie because there's an after credit scene that ties in with this and it ties in with this. It's like sometimes I just want to see the movie. (laughs) That's what you get the AMC pass for. That's true. 
I'm kind of with you on animated. the animated stuff, though, too. Like, the, the DC animated movies are just... Fantastic. So good. And they they did one, the death of Superman and then the reign of the Superman as, like, a two-movie thing. And I think that was in very limited release in theaters. Like, you couldn't go anywhere and watch it, but you could see it in a lot of cities. But those yeah. things are just killer i wish those were more hmm. i wish those were more accessible other than you have to go and buy the blu-ray for it you know yeah 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 exactly and i think yeah that's what kills me because i'm like you know warner brothers you know it's just known for animation um like or at least when yeah when i was growing up it was like, like a lot of stuff was warner brothers stuff it's like you see but or i don't know as much anymore but like books when used to come out from behind the warner brothers thing so it's like you guys do animation. Disney does animation. Why aren't there more, you know, you own these massive comic book companies. It's like, why don't you do these two things that seemingly should mesh well together? Like, why don't you put them on these big platforms? Like, because I went and saw the Teen Titans Go movie, like, because I like Teen Titans Go. Like, and I, <laughs> I mean, like, I thought it was funny. It was just a goofy movie. And it, like, you know, and it did well. Like, I mean, what, I think it made, like, like $50 million or something, like, which is more than, you know, you'd expect it to be for, like, a TV show, you know, like a Cartoon Network little mm. cartoon that, you know, feature length film. Yeah, that, that cartoon evolved, right? Well, it, well sort of. It, it was it was goofy, then went to, like, cartoony goofy, right? Well, that, but it, that was two different. Well, there was Teen Titans. There was Teen, there's Titans, Teen Titans Go. And Teen Titans Go. But it's, like, the same voices, same character, same, like, but it just... Yeah. It evolved. It's fun. I like that show. I like that cartoon. Yeah, too much fun. Cause, yeah, because it's, it's like, you know, because I was explaining it to somebody, and I was like, it's kind of like, like, Teen Titans Go is kind of like, it's always funny in a way, because the characters, like, the way that they do the characters, like, they're not, like, great. Like, the characters <laughs> are terrible, and they do, like, they're not heroic in a lot of ways. No. And they're, like, doing schemes. Like those characters, and it's always funny. Or they have these weird schemes, or they're doing pyramid schemes, or they're they become slum lords, or whatever. Like they do all these weird things, and it's just so random. And it's I don't know. It it reminds me of like you know the old cartoons like Animaniacs and stuff. Like it's just so wacky. It's just so bizarre. And I I don't know. I know. I think a lot of people gave it grief because it was it wasn't the Teen Titans proper cartoon like the one that yeah. came out like back in 2004 but i'm like yeah but that show still exists i mean it sucks it didn't get a get the closure but i mean it still exists and it's still good and it's still there um and this is something just different goofy like a different kind of thing mm-hmm. dc yeah. muppet babies <laughs> it's true one of my yeah. yeah my favorite episodes is when they do the booty scooty <laughs> i mean come on you can't take yeah, it seriously right. you know well, yeah. here's we're getting close to the end. I don't want to miss the chance, just in case. Do you have any okay. projects that you're working on that you kind of want to talk about, that you want to plug, that you're excited about working on? Um, I am working on a new series. Um, still, It's still in the development. I mean, it's being written, but uh, it's called Mega Centurion. Um, like, I... I have like the like the first issue is finished, but the second issue is getting close to finished. And it's a new book that I you know I wanted to do something a little bit different from you know Secrets and Shadows and Clusterfuck, so it's not completely like either of those. Um, and it's kind of a Power Rangers type story, but very different. Like it, or like it talks about it's about these three heroes and they were called the mega centurions and they were essentially like these young heroes that, you know, fought aliens and had a giant mech and all that stuff. Um, and basically what happens is they, you know, they basically go and they fight the evil emperor of the alien race or whatever, or the prince of this alien race. And they win, right? They save the day. But what happens is, um, they lose their powers and they can't prove that they're the mega centurions. So everyone thinks the Mega Centurions are dead, but they're alive and they can't prove it. So like they have to deal with the fallout of, you know, what happens if you're like a young superhero uh, in that aspect of like, 
they have to leave school to fight aliens. They have to, you know, leave their families to fight aliens, you know, and kind of have to, like, ditch people, you know, because they're trying to save people's lives and, and just dealing with the fallout of that. So now they're, like, like, a little bit older, and they're just living these rough lives. And, like, it was like, you know, I kind of would tell people it's like they saved the world, but now they can't pay rent. Um, and it's, so it's kind of about them, or at least the first issue is more about their struggle. Like one of them works at a, is a waitress at a restaurant. One of them is a telemarketer. One of them works at a gas station. And they're just kind of dealing with that frustration, that frustration of like watching people mourn the hero and they can't prove that that's them. So they're not getting the rewards for all their sacrifices. Um, and it, it morphs into something a little bit lighter, but it starts out a bit heavy, like, just so you know, like, what they're going through. Um, but it, 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 my plan is it's only going to be, like, four issues. Hopefully the first issue I can put out, um, you know, around the summer. Uh, we'll see. But uh, it was something I wanted to do. with something different. It was something a little bit, uh, something a little bit new, just new for me. Uh so, yeah, it's a book I'm looking forward to. It's, uh, the artist is Dexter Wee, who did Secrets and Shadows with me. And um, the colorist is, uh, he also worked on Secrets and Shadows, but he did, like, the grayscaling. His name is Kotek Carbajal. Uh, the letterer is a guy, his name is uh, Christian Dokolomansky. And the editor is, the editor I use for most of my stuff, his name is Stephen Forbes. Um, and it's, you know, it should be a good book. I, I've, I've sold uh, some previews. I had some previews at the conventions. I had some at NWICon. I had some at C2E2. And the cover seemed to catch people's eyes. So hopefully they'll, people will enjoy it. Well, I certainly hope so. Fun. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on to our show and talking with us for a little while. And hopefully in the future here, we'll get a chance to catch up when everything just kind of blows up and becomes huge. And you're going to be this massive star. And you will say, hey, the Pudding Guys, they had me on. And now that everybody knows my name, we've got to come back on the show. and uh... <laughs> Give them roles in the TV okay. show, right? You know, That's right. basic stuff. Just a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, most definitely, most definitely. Well, excellent. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time.